Welcome to the Purposely Aligned Entrepreneur Podcast presented by Boss Girl Creative. This is episode number 473, which is a celebration of nine years of podcasting. Now let's dive in. Have you already found business success but feel lonely at the top? Or do you feel like you're at a place in your business where others just don't get it? Or maybe you feel like you have to make yourself smaller in order for others to not feel less than. Or maybe just a little bit of all three. But with all that said, there is good news because I've been there and I see you, sister. I'm Taylor Bradford, the torchbearer of this podcast and sisterhood, and I'm here to lead and inspire you to stay purposely aligned in the success you have found and provide you with support, guidance, and a sisterhood to keep going because I do get it. Your business journey isn't meant to be traveled alone. So grab a notebook, your favorite pen, and a bevy, and let's dive into this together with this latest podcast episode. Welcome to the Purposely Aligned Entrepreneur Podcast presented by Boss Girl Creative and me. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to this very special episode, episode 473, which happens to be the podcast's ninth official anniversary. And I'm excited to have a conversation with a really good friend today. I have Angie Jacobson with me. Before we get into our conversation, let's find out what's been going on in the land of social media. Social media headline number one, Meta is rolling out broadcast channels to pages with over 10,000 followers. This will be a new way to connect with your audience on Facebook and Messenger. Social media headline number two, Apple's 30% fee for Facebook and Instagram ads is expanding to more regions. If you're buying Facebook or Instagram ads through iOS, you are going to be paying more. Social media headline number three, Meta has switched AI labels from made with AI to AI info tag. Meta is updating its labels to cater for lesser edits using AI tools. Social media headline number four, TikTok appoints a cybersecurity firm to assess its U.S. data security, but it's probably a little too late at this stage. Social media headline number five, TikTok is developing a new AI chatbot called Genie. TikTok's looking to make a bigger jump into the generative AI race. Social media headline number six, Pinterest adds options for sharing pin boards to other apps. This will be a new way to showcase your Pinterest collections. And that wraps up this week's social media headlines. Okay, so very special episode for me in more than a couple of ways. First of all, nine years as a podcaster, that is a very, very, like the amount of people that get this far is probably 1%. And to be here to have recorded 473 episodes without missing a week, and I've been doing this since July 1st of 2015. Actually, I started before July 1st, but the first three episodes came out in the first week of July. I think technically back then it was July 1. But to be able to sit down and record every single week, would I like to have things in the can at this point nine years in? Absolutely. But I do fly by the seat of my pants and uh, here we are. And I've still managed to record an episode without replaying a past episode when I didn't have something to talk about. Like I always usually have something to talk about. So that makes this very special for me. Also sharing this moment with a really good friend, Angie Jacobson, who is here on the other side of the mic. We are in the Sugar Creek office. So if the ambient sound is different, that is why we're in an open room and uh, I, we just can't both fit in my closet. So <laughs> here we are. So I want to have a conversation with Angie. Actually, I'm going to put her in the spot 
uh, in the spotlight in the sense that she is going to basically narrate this for me and be the one asking the questions, which I think is very, very special for us um, in in a variety of ways. So Angie, I would love for you to talk about how we met because I know through the last couple of years I have when I do sit down behind the microphone, I actually am speaking to you because I know you've been a longtime fan of the show. Yeah. So when I am thinking of episodes, I am actually like thinking about what you might be needing in your own business, um, which makes it benefit me in a way that I can bring my brain and help further you along in some fashion. So it's really great because in podcasting, when you record in a closet and you don't have somebody else you're actually actively speaking to, it makes it lonely. But if I know who I am trying to speak to, it just makes things more joyful for me. So thank you for that. I don't know if you ever knew that, no, but no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <Yay. laughs> um, but I'd like for you to share how we met and kind of where we kind of like came on this journey, because I do think it's a very special one. I think it's very kismet. It was very serendipitous about how we met. And uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, first of all, congratulations on your ninth year. Uh, how we met, uh, I'm thinking it was 2020. I have always been an entrepreneur, my husband and I, for many, many years. And uh, we decided to start a wedding venue. Um, and actually, you met a dear friend of mine who owns a boutique in Granbury. And I think you were there with someone else from the wedding industry um, who I had met previously. So we, we, we always find it interesting that we met through other people before we ever met. But um, I think it was someone that said, you need to ask Taylor to come down and check out your venue. Um, it wasn't finished out. I think our courtyard uh, wasn't there. Um, we were still in masks. I do remember that. Um, so it was strange anyway to meet a new person and we're masked up in this building that's not finished, but almost instantly, I think we had a, a unique connection. Um, I had no clue what I was doing, uh, as far as the wedding venue business. Um, but I, I, not just because I'm in front of you, uh, your podcast has, um, uh, filled me in. And now that I know the little secret that you were talking to me, that's great. I, because it was always felt like you were speaking to me. I was like, yes, good. Now I have a, uh, I have more knowledge, but, uh, so we met and then I was asking your opinion on just different flows and different ideas. Um, you were a very well respected member of the wedding industry community still are. And, um, I think it just grew from there. We just connected and, um, our, brains i don't know or if they're similar but we're very curious people that's the similarity that we have and our conversations not only in the wedding venue business but since then you know they can go way off the rail so um might want to warn people <laughs> <laughs> in advance we're going to try to stay on the rails of of the podcast so that was it and it's been a, a great friendship and i admire you tremendously um, not only for what you do here, uh, you're very inspiring and you have taught me a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you for, for giving of yourself to me in the podcast world. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Feedback does not come my way very often. So I think that's probably one of the most lonely things about podcasting is the, like just pulling teeth to get somebody to reach out. And so I'm always overjoyed when I do see somebody reach out, I had somebody reach out recently on through the DMs of the Boss Girl Creative Instagram. And I was just like, I had missed the tag. So the story had already disappeared. And I was just so sad that I missed the tag. And so I reached out and said, I'm really sorry I missed your tag. So shout out to Faceless Blogger Mom for having a really lovely conversation in the DMs and for just like showing that you cared about whatever podcast episode it was that you listened to and 
because it is so lonely, I do find so much joy when I'm able to connect with somebody that is listening or has listened. So again, shout out to Faceless Blogger Mom for reaching out because it truly made my day. Yeah. But yeah. It, it's those it's those moments for me mm-hmm. and um, it's partly why I keep going. And uh, it's been an interesting journey getting to here nine years, especially without repeating episodes. I know a lot of podcasters, if they're seasonal or if they are taking time off for whatever reason, maybe it's holidays or what have you, they will reshare a past episode. And I've never done that. I've always sat behind the microphone. And have I repeated an episode? I'm sure I have in the sense of like the theme, but is it verbatim? No, it's yeah. never been verbatim. So, yes. and, and I would like you to um, share because I, I just learned this. Um, I know that uh, if one of your episodes really speaks to me, you usually get, uh, I'm usually driving down the road, which I know is not safe. Please don't do that. But I'm taking a picture of you on my screen in my car and I'll usually send a text like, oh, this is great. Um, so I had asked you before we sat down to have this conversation, is there an algorithm? How, how do you gain new listeners and, and how do you keep account of who is listening or if you're just, you know, speaking off into the void? So um, it was very interesting. So share, share how, you, how, how that is for you. So podcasting, for whatever reason, is so closed-minded when it comes to statistics. And we have Apple to thank for this. Apple does not like to share all of the details. Like I get a download number, I get geographic information, I get just some smaller um, statistics. It is nothing like what you would get with analytics to a website or a blog, which is so incredibly frustrating. And also, if you are listening through the Apple podcast platform, if you are just a listener, I don't have a clue that you are listening. I only see download numbers. And so my metrics are me just seeing if I have increased my download numbers over the week before or over the month before. And and we're in summer season right now as we're recording this, and summer is a slowdown period for podcasts because people are traveling more, they're spending more time with their families, and so there's less commuting going on and less just extracurricular listening. And so we're in a, a slow period right now anyway, but yeah, I don't know who's listening. Like that's so frustrating because in the Apple podcast platform, which is where a majority of you guys listen from... I don't know that you're actually listening. I'm. It's only tracking downloads. So I don't really know how many listeners of my show I have. And the podcast rankings, um, there's a couple of different platforms that are ranking podcasts. I don't know where they're getting their data from. I mean, I guess maybe from downloads, but it doesn't tell us the full picture. And I can see like how many people in Texas are listening and I can see what countries are listening. But outside of that, if you're not downloading the episode, then I don't know that you're actually listening. And in the blogging world or in the the social media world where you have interactions with people and you can at least put a person behind the thing that you're interacting with, you don't get that opportunity with podcasts because you're listening when it's convenient to you. And unless I say something inspiring that moves you enough to seek out a separate platform to come talk to me, I don't know that I have affected you. I don't know if I have changed your world or improved your business or or what have you. And I don't know if you're sharing things. It's just so wild. And we're in 2024. You would think that this would be a lot easier for podcasters, but it still isn't. And, which is so frustrating, but I do share the podcast on all of the platforms. So it goes out to Facebook, it goes out to Pinterest, it goes out to LinkedIn, it does go out to Instagram. And I also, because I do so much in my day to day, I am dropping balls. And so like the podcast 
social media, if I don't like get it scheduled right away, then it just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And, but we have gotten better where on Instagram, on the Boss Girl Creative Instagram, I am pulling audio out uh, like a one minute snippet and turning it into a reel um, in hopes that I can utilize Instagram's algorithm to get more people to find my show. Great idea. And 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 truly, like when you're using Apple Podcast search feature, it's really hard to find an active show. You can search for a business podcast or a marketing podcast, and it's going to serve up what people are listening to. But that doesn't guarantee the show is active. Mm-hmm. There is so much dormancy in podcasts because it is, if you make it past a year, you are in the top 10% of podcasters. It is a very challenging thing to stick with uh, because the feedback just not the same and they will apple um, will promote a show that's not had a new episode in two years as long as people are still listening to the old episodes Mm -hmm. so those of us that are actively producing content week in and week out we don't get any more benefit from staying active in their platform it's very frustrating wow Okay, so, um, and I'm very guilty of this. <laughs> I just discovered uh, I I've only downloaded a few, probably, um, because there are some that just really speak to me, and I'm like, oh, I can't forget. Uh, I have a tendency, like a lot of entrepreneurs, I have way too many irons in my fire. Uh, good intentions, but now I know to download, and that helps you. I also listen to other podcasts. Um, that's so I mean, I, now I know how to help all podcasters and, and it is important if we enjoy something that someone puts out there. I know this is a business owner too. Feedback is tremendous for all of us, um, especially the good stuff. But, but you know, good uh, uh, criticism, as long as it's, you know, productive, it's going to help us on the other side. Uh, but um, I can't see that anybody would be critical of you, Taylor. Um, so yes, do, if you're listening, uh, try to give her some feedback, uh, a, a rating. I know that I've gone and I've rated. Uh, does that help promote you up at all, the ratings? I don't think so. Like when shows are brand new, you can get yourself into new and noteworthy based on how many people you can drive. It's why celebrities get so much traction in their shows because they already have huge followings and they can just legitimately in a a brand new launch load hundreds of thousands of people in. they're downloading, they're listening, and they may be rating um, the show and that all lands them in the new and noteworthy. But I don't think that there's a ton of weight behind ratings um, like you would get out of like a Google business review, Mm -hmm. even though the ratings are nice Mm -hmm. and they do help other listeners when they're looking at the ratings, how people are receiving a show. There's no, there's no weight in the algorithm. And, And it's really, I don't really think it's an algorithm per se, because I can't affect it being an active show producing new content every single week, which you would think would be a signal to Apple that I should be at the forefront of somebody searching for a business or marketing right. podcast, but that's right. not the not how it works. I'm also surprised that I can be listening to old episodes and never realize that. So here we are again, you're teaching me something <laughs> sitting across from you. Um, and it sounds like Taylor and I've had this discussion about a lot of things, but it sounds like maybe not just Apple, but uh, all podcasting is ripe for a disruption. Things need to be shaken up a bit uh, to encourage. I mean, of course, whether it's a business or what, whatever your genre is for podcast listening, it again, if we're gaining something out of it, we want to encourage the people that do the work. Uh, we need to, we need to keep them going, keep, keep them afloat. So yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm going to be interested to see how you disrupt that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, nine years in, I have not figured that out, but, uh, (laughs) I, I, I believe it. I believe that you can. Okay. So, uh, I also want to know what continues to drive you, to motivate you, Um, especially on the heels of that, if you're not getting a lot of 
listener feedback or or you you can't see that you know you are you are really affecting a big swath of people and i know that you are gifted with teaching um if you have knowledge you will freely share it um i've seen it time and time again uh, in person over over the podcast but uh, it's just who you are so what continues to motivate you and drive you to keep going I feel like if I am helping one person, that it is the mission that I have. It The podcast has always been a passion project, and it was never meant to be something that I needed to be driven out of desperation. And I didn't want to use it. I didn't want to set myself up to have to be, I have to put food on the table with this thing. This thing is going to make or break me. And because I have not allowed myself to make that be what was the motivator or the driving force. It has allowed me to keep joy in the forefront of why this means so much. And and it goes all the way back to my curiosity about blogging, which is what started the podcast. I had a 40 lesson series way back in 2011 that I started called hashtag blogging education. And I was just so curious about the business of blogging and the social media platforms that were starting to emerge and teaching what I was learning so that I could potentially help one person grow in the thing that I was teaching and in that moment. And I've never let go of that. I think that if I can help one business owner find their path forward and help them gain whatever it is that they feel they're lacking, or if they can step over a hurdle that they're currently facing, then I have done exactly what I was meant to do with this podcast. And not having the pressure to reach X amount of downloads or reach X amount of dollar signs has allowed me to still show up behind the mic every single week It is legitimately the only thing that I've ever done this long, this consistently, because it's driven by passion. Mm -hmm. And and I, I hope that comes across in the episodes that I am here to help you legitimately move forward. There's no other angle that I've got behind this. And business, like just business in general and the different types of business that I'm involved in, And like my roofing company, it runs so differently than my event rental company and our landlord stuff that we do. You know, we have residential and commercial property and we have tenants and that runs so differently than this podcast and the way that like I'll be driving down the road and I will see a business has already gone out of business and I'm thinking, oh. They didn't market enough. Mm. They weren't visible enough. Mm. They weren't social enough. And I, that is really where now I'm steering and I'm excited to, you're going to hear in this episode, a brand new intro to the show because you can have all of your pillars in place and you can have a rock star foundation, but did you build it on a cracked surface and how are you visible? Because without visibility, without being social with your business, you will not make money. Mm -hmm. And you can be driven by your why. You can be driven by your how. You can be driven by all of these things because you've got, you've done the work. You put in like who your, your ideal customer is, what your business purpose is, what your why is. You've done that. And you've got your, your client journey mapped out. You've got all of these things done. But if you're not visible, you will not make it. Mm -hmm. And I can see that driving down the road and I'm like, wow, they just weren't visible enough. And prior to us even starting record, you talked about your son and this possible journey into a food truck. And I'm like, a food truck is a great idea because of the visibility factor. You're literally a a banner on wheels. You're broadcasting everywhere you go, which when you're just brick and mortar, you don't get that opportunity. You put a sign out at the road and hope somebody sees it. But if you don't go out and affect visibility for yourself, you won't make it. In in a world of social media 
where we have Facebook saying, hey, your friend is interested in this event, are you? Like we are literally given so many choices every single day. If you don't rise above how many choices are available to you, you will not last. Right, right. And we also talked about relationships and how important that is, which you are very good at building your relationships, which you were also in all the series of podcasts. Um, I, you know, when you talk about pillars and for me, uh, you taught me about, you know, having my sales funnel uh, correct when we, we were in the venue business, which still makes me giggle because I was like, what was she talking about? <laughs> so I feel like a lot of people that do, I know that I have, I've owned and left many businesses, but that's something entrepreneurs do. We start businesses a lot of times never having the intention to do it forever. So I understand your passion project here. I know that it comes through. Um, I just hope listeners that have never had the chance to interact with you in person or that have never seen a video clip of you, it, it is completely sincere the uh, that you want to teach and you, you really want to share. You just want to share your knowledge. You are a curious sponge and um, you do love to share that. So you talked about your pillars and, and we were discussing earlier about purpose. And um, that is something that uh, I think you do very well in all of your businesses. You always seem to know your purpose when you, when you come out of the gate. How do you, if for somebody that, uh, you, so we're not going to teach them how to open their business. You're, you're talking to people right now. We're going to assume that have already opened their business and they know what their purpose is. They knew what their, their game plan was. And what's your best advice? Because you have been a long time entrepreneur. So say they're three years down the road in business. They're tired. Their visibility seems like it's sagging. You're talking about that specifically. What, what advice do you have for them? I think you do have to get back to if, you, if you've if you been in business this long and you're struggling with visibility because visibility is what equals to dollar signs, um, the your percentage. So if you... If you need 10% of 100 people to to make money, then how do you get 200 people? How do you get 300 people? And it really is a numbers game at, at the visibility level. But I do think if you're feeling like there is a lack, you have to go back. I, I talk about a puzzle. So you have all of these individual pu- puzzle pieces that make up your pillars that any one puzzle piece is not effective just on its own. The puzzle has to be put together in order for you to appropriately be magnetic in your brand. And purpose is part of that. But has your purpose changed in the two years, three years, four years that you've been in business? Even even once you hit one year in business, has your purpose changed? Have you realized you're attracting the wrong type of client? Have you realized you need to attract a higher level client? I'm seeing that in the wedding world right now. We are, we came out of COVID. We saw once people could start gathering together again, we saw a spike in just business in general. We were getting, you know, people were getting engaged again and that cycle started again for the wedding pros. But now we are seeing a very big slump and I the conversations that I'm seeing um, just generally are that people are having their worst years right now or their worst year in 2024. And they're not sure what else to do. They're getting as skinny as they can get. They are selling off inventory. They are like doing all of these things. And it truly does come down to visibility. So if the client that you were attracting is now on the struggle bus themselves, and they have changed their own personal values to align with what and how they spend money, then you're going to now have to find a new client. You're going to have to find, you're going to have to level up or sell more at a cheaper price. Like that's really all it boils down to. If the middle of the road client has changed their values and they are spending money more intentionally, and it happens to not be the thing that you sell, you either need to reformulate what you're selling and sell it at a higher price with more experience, um, experiential factors attached and attract the luxury client, 
or you need to scale back how you do the thing and sell it cheaper and sell more of it. There's no middle road. So me seeing people saying, I'm struggling, I am not making sales, will step back. And I know that's really hard because you're in it. And if you're a solopreneur, you're the thing. And it's really hard for you to step back and be like, crap, what am I supposed to do? Here's your two options. You only have two. You either scale up into the luxury market where they are still spending bukus of money because that's how that market works, or you reduce your costs and you sell more at a cheaper price. And there's nothing wrong with either decision, but you're going to have to make a hard decision for yourself, which direction you're going. And again, it comes back down to visibility. Right. Uh, Also, I have been in the trenches, you know, uh, I do understand this. And as business owners, we both know that those are hard decisions. And when you work and you pour everything into it, and then you come to this uh, danger, you know, you're in danger and uh, you, a lot of times people freeze and they don't make either decision. Uh, I, I personally think it is from fear, fear of making the wrong choice for this, this thing that you've poured all your heart and soul into. Um, but I, I agree. You only have two choices and, um, it, it, it is, I always heard you speak of the thing or solopreneur and it's very true. You know, um, it's hard to make those decisions, but I also think it's a time we're in an election year. It's the economy. Um, you and I've had many conversations about the cost of things. And, um, this is, I, I think you use the word pivot. I use the word adjust. You, you have to constantly be adjusting to not only your clientele, uh, what you sell, you just have to be able to be adaptable to the volatility of the, the, the market and, and being in business. Uh, I actually had a question and there went a squirrel. <laughs> I, had a question in that. Uh, I, I guess my question would be, um, how do you encourage those that are really stuck in that very tough spot? Um, and again, the, for those of you that don't have the great privilege of knowing Taylor personally, um, she's in a lot of businesses. And so I know that you've encountered that before. So what kind of encouragement do you give folks that are in that hard spot? First of all, I, I am a huge proponent of you having a very diversified income and not putting all of your eggs into one basket because that will set you up to fail very quickly, especially when the market becomes volatile as it is right now. We've got costs of goods that are just stupid and uh, the election year is not helping. And it it's mind boggling that we lack this education in our world where people are not taught to you know, do this kind of investing or make this kind of business decision where maybe you become an affiliate for something that aligns or you collaborate with somebody that could help your clients out in a a very special way, but that still aligns with what you're doing. And so if you are in this fork in the road, and I know how scary that can be, and quitting is not an option, like you legitimately need something else. I, I would encourage you, it, it's not an ego thing. Let, let's just lay this out on the line. It, it is not an ego thing for you to go get a second job to help you in this time period. Where can you pick up more revenue that will take this stress off of your back and you trying to make a pivot of either producing more at a cheaper cost or, or price or a leveling up into the next market. There is nothing wrong with working a second job, working a third job, working a fourth job. Literally, if you don't have multiple streams of income, you will fail when something like this happens. I mean, we saw it in COVID. I can't tell you how many businesses I saw that were just shackled closed because of 
what happened during COVID. And those that managed to survive COVID had other revenue streams already in place. And so I'm going to encourage you. I know it, it could be really hard in this moment for you to decide to do another revenue stream, but being a business owner comes with a lot of sacrifice. And if somebody has never said that to you before, I'm going to be the one that's saying it with love and a lot of heart that being a business owner is sacrificial. <laughs> like okay, you, yeah. You're sacrificing your time to spend it in a way that might bring you more joy, but something has to happen or something has to get done in your business because you are the business owner. And there's a lot of really great things that come out of being a business owner, but there is a lot of really crappy things that you have to endure as a business owner. And this may just be one of those, but I don't want you to give up if you feel like there is a market that you can serve and make money from, then go get a second job so that you can figure out how to better serve that market, whether it's leveling up or doubling what you're doing. Yeah, very good answer. That's that's so true. Uh, I call it supplementing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's just different ways to say it. Uh, and you brought up my son earlier. That is something that I told him out of the gate, uh, which I think a lot of your audience is probably already established business owners, but wherever you are, that is something I advised him this morning, actually, is that, you know, your first two, three years, you're going to need supplemental income because you won't make money as a business owner. So that, that is a, a, a very good answer um, and, and encouragement for people. Um, so uh, I want to ask you, too, how do you gain your inspiration each week when you, when you talk about different topics? Um, because you've covered so many. One of my favorite all-time episodes was about imposter syndrome. Um, it was alarming to me that I think you gave off 10, and I was like, oh, I think I've got my cup. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I've got another syndrome I need to work on. Um, so what, what inspires you? Is it, is it just something that you see that catches your, your attention and you do a little dive on it and you can always, you know, pull it back to, to business. Cause that's really, um, it always comes back to business. So tell me what inspires you each week. Sometimes there are weeks where I'm like, what am I going to talk about? The talking part is never the problem. Yeah. It's the what am I going to talk about? And then there are other weeks where I'm like, oh, I'm talking about that mm -hmm. because it's something that I've learned or something that I've experienced or something that I've witnessed. And I feel like my best episodes are where it's coming from something I've learned, something I've experienced or something I've witnessed. When I'm feeling a lack because it was just a slow business week for me <laughs> <laughs> where I feel a lack, I'll go out to Pinterest mm -hmm. and I will just put in a random search term and see what populates. And then I will just look for something that's inspiring to me. And then I'll just start doing deep dives into what other people have to say about that thing. And then I, I'm taking notes and I'm like, okay, I can make this relevant to where I'm at right now. And so I'm always speaking from a place of relevancy with how I am right now in this moment. So if you listen to an episode three years ago, Whatever I was talking about, there was some relevancy. If it doesn't fall into the category of me experiencing it, witnessing it, or learning it, then I it, I won't have a conversation behind it. So I will fine tune to what is going on in my world based on what I end up talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So something uh, we also touched on before we, we sat down to do the podcast, you mentioned uh, social media headlines and you said uh, you do them at the beginning of your episodes and you said, you know, I ha I've had no feedback. I don't, I don't know if anybody likes them or not. And I said, Oh, I do. I love them uh, because I'm not going to go and find out that information on my own. It's, it's good. So that's very relevant. Every week you give us something relevant going on. Um, I think it was a couple of episodes ago that I was listening to, uh, and it was specifically with Meta and not having the, the ability to opt out of something. So um, again, listeners, 
we should really feed back because <laughs> I, I do not either. Uh, but I, I do love that. And um, you do stay very relevant. And I know there are different topics with relation to um, being an entrepreneur. I know uh, we've had our side conversation about AI and creativity. Um, so what do you see on the horizon? And, and we're talking about visibility too. So, um, and this is, this, these are our conversations on the regular right here, try to keep up with them, how you can help those that are out there doing the work every day in the grind. What do you see on the horizon? And, and, and how you can tie that to visibility. I'm asking you to look into your crystal ball right now, Taylor. What do you see that uh, could, we could get some insight into how this is all going to start to, to pan out as far as um, what's on the horizon with, with visibility, social media, because that's really the only game any of us have anymore with regard to marketing as far as it's, it's a bigger tool. Yeah, I think... Um... Right now, what I'm seeing in the landscape, people are really frustrated again with Instagram, which obviously is is meta by default, and they have continued to adjust their algorithm. And, and vocally, publicly, they have said it is to favor the smaller creator. But what it is turning out to be, at least in this moment as of this recording, it is hurting smaller creators. The conversations that I'm even seeing with some of the larger creators who are producing content out the wazoo, like they're producing way more content than I am. And 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 I say that just because I am a multi-hyphenate business owner. This is not the only thing I'm doing. So my content creation is spanned across multiple business fronts. It's not just this one. But the ones that are all in on the thing that they're doing, they are struggling with visibility right now. Now, their sales funnels are still producing a level of income that has not completely made them panic, but the visibility is down. And I continue to see that same type of conversation, and I have seen that kind of conversation in my social experiment, which I've revealed everybody now knows, or if you're brand new to the show or you haven't tuned in in a while, I have a second Instagram. Well, I've had multiple Instagrams in this social experiment, but the one that I'm going all in on is digitally tailored. And what I am seeing people that I am following through that channel is a frustration of visibility. But here's the thing, I have bought multiple courses, I have bought multiple masterclasses, like in the last five months of this social experiment, I'm not even gonna share how much I've I've spent to do this. The What I'm seeing as a huge failing point for these people is there's no follow-up. You, you got me in on the thing that you wanted me to buy, but then it's been crickets on your follow-up game, which should be your sales funnel, your email list, your automation. And I don't know if there's just this miss in all of these stupid courses that people keep hyping up and they're going viral, but nobody's doing the work. They're just buying the course to resell the course without actually doing the work, which is not a business model. That will never work long term. It might make you some money right now, but it is something that's not, you can't put your eggs there. Like you just can't. But the follow up isn't there. And I'm like, the only two things you absolutely have control over is your own website and your email list. You are renting space on Instagram. You are renting space on Facebook. You are renting space on Pinterest. You don't own them. You have no control over how they make decisions in their business. We as business owners are not their target audience. We are gaming their platforms in order to get free eyeballs. That's how this, this this is what we've turned it into. And we've never been their ideal customer. Their ideal customer is the soccer mom who is sharing their kid photos, like on literally every platform. That is their ideal customer. Us as business owners, we are renting their space and we don't get to be upset when it doesn't work in our favor. 
If you haven't figured out how to start an email list, if you haven't figured out how to create a website to get people on and to create content that will live there forever, you aren't in this for the long haul. You're in this for the short term and it will never last. So on the horizon, what do I see? I see more people using AI in their teams. I think that that will be a very powerful way for solopreneurs to do more. I recently learned how to make chat GPT talk like me. And so there's a way if you're in the paid version of chat GPT that you can go in and say, here's my voice. I want you to like first you ask it to analyze um, your voice, your tone, your I, there's four different things that you ask it and it will spit out all of the things related to what it's reading. And then you go and you input that data over into ChatGBT. So now when you're asking it questions and it's giving you back answers, it's in your voice. So you can effectively build a strong AI team working for you. And I think we're gonna see more of that because it will allow solopreneurs to have more team at a very low cost. Wow. which is very powerful. Wow, great information. I, I never knew that till just now. I didn't even have to listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I got it right here. Okay, so as you were saying all of that, uh, you talked about follow-up. That was always very hard for me. I, I'm, I'm out of the wedding industry now, uh, for now, I should say. Uh, we sold our venue. But that was always difficult for me be, because... Uh, I had a small team of people. Uh, it's never enough, uh, especially when you're you're running something hospitality, and th- there's so many moving parts. And again, I know we're we're mainly talking right now to people that are in business. So uh, it's something you say in your opening credits uh, that you're not alone. It's it's the truth. Uh, it's we all experience the exact same thing, but follow-up was very hard for me. Or I should say, not the follow-up, but but, but the keeping on. You know, how, how many times, and I, I know we had conversations and I and, and you, you did podcasts on it too. It blows my mind how many times you have to keep tapping at their door. And uh, and and how that feels as a person too that you because I don't like to be bothered. Uh, and, and nobody likes to be bothered, but it always felt like, uh, oh, you know, I'm overstepping. So how can you encourage listeners to, to keep going and, uh, try, I guess the thing I'm asking you too, is what would you say to them to help them get over that cringy, creepy feeling of, oh, I'm, you know, these people are going to hate me if I don't stop with regard to follow up, because you're good at that. I think one of the the biggest things is that you just have to rip the Band-Aid off and keep talking. Because if you're not talking about your product, you're not selling your product. So you cannot be scared that you're going to offend somebody by talking about your product because you have no clue where they are in their journey to discovering you or deciding to make that purchase decision because they've now seen you 15 times. And the ones that you are like, feeling affronted by bothering, once they come into your fold, they're going to want to be your megaphones. And so those are your ideal customers. They are going to want other people to see what it is that you are selling and they will not be bothered by it. I do think the wedding industry is a little unique uh, from the sense that we don't get a lot of repeat customers. And if you are in that kind of industry where you have one-offs, your your message has to go out every single day because you don't know when somebody is going to find you. And I think that as business owners, once you get a, a repeat customer coming back to buy the thing that you're selling, they're not going to care. They're going to be like, I totally support this business. And by watching your stories or interacting with your posts, even if they've already bought from you, that's a free way to support somebody. And that is triggering the algorithms on those social platforms to continue to show it to other people. So it behooves you if you love somebody so much that you really believe in their mission, their purpose, the thing that they're selling, to continue to support them because that is how they get 
their product, their service out in front of other eyeballs. But you as a business owner can't be scared to talk about your product because at the end of the day, you got to make money. And how you do that is you keep showing up every single day. And that's what I learned from that smashing sales course that I bought. You, once they buy, they, and they love, they're going to continue to support you. Now, whether or not they watch all of your stories, that's not on you, that's on them. But you should never feel like you can't sell. And at the end of the day, if we're not running hobbies, we're running businesses and we got to make money. And the only way you can do that is if you're sharing your product. Yeah, very, very good advice. Also a good reminder, um, just to like, like a post, you know, read a story. You're right. Uh, I often forget that too. You know, if I'm just scrolling mindlessly, uh, I try to be better specifically with my business friends. Um, that, that, that is a, a, a great reminder for that. So, um, you're on your ninth year. It's a long time. <laughs> it's a very long time. Uh, Taylor knows that I have short attention span, so that's how my eyes are very big across from her right now. Uh, where do you see the future going? You spoke a little bit about it, that um, you have a little bit of a tweak of a vision for the purposely aligned entrepreneur who I still want to call boss girl creative. So where, where do you see the future? So I feel like when I shifted into the purposely aligned entrepreneur, I wanted to attract the business owner that had found success, but was still feeling lonely at the top. And since that pivot, I have learned that women business owners that have found success and are feeling lonely, lonely at the top are not willing to say anything about it. And that's me asking and reaching out to women business owners that I know I can see their level of success and then just point blank asking, you know, these hard questions. And it it troubles me. It makes me really sad that I cannot in this moment serve the this audience in a way that I find meaningful because we as women are so freaking scared to show vulnerability because we're terrified some other female is going to do it before us. And so I, I'm having to shelve this for right now. Um, and I don't believe in a six-figure mastermind. I uh, That's so stupid to me to get women to have to pay six figures to, to play with other women that are making, like, stupid. So stupid. So I'm, I'm shelving that for now. And what I am now pivoting into is helping you become more visible and helping your business become more social. Because at the end of the day, it does require sales. And if you aren't visible and you are not being social in your business, you will not make sales. So having your pillars figure it out. That's important. You're, I'm going to always say, go buy my book. It will help you get all of that figured out if you've not done the work, because it does require the work in order for you to be visible. You can't have the puzzle put together and then get visible because you won't attract the right audience if you haven't done the work. So I'm always going to say, go do the work, but you can't make money without being visible. So that's where this podcast is shifted into is helping you to, it, it comes down to money. Like I want you to make your first $1 million or your first 500,000, like whatever you want to make monetarily into your world, if whatever amount of money you want to bring into your world, I want to help you make that. The only way you're going to make that is if I can help you get more visible. And that's where I feel like, okay, I'm shelving, trying to help these women <laughs> who are just terrified, truly terrified to have open conversations for fear of it just coming back on them. And that's so sad. And I, I, ha I don't have a solution to that right now because I am such an open person about having like where I'm struggling in business right now and going out and trying to find a solution for the problem or, or what have you. But there's not a lot of business owners that are like that, that are as curious to fix something or to be open, or they don't have a, a strong network around them where they can feel that way. And again, I don't think that you have to spend six figures to get yourself into that room, but so I'm shelving that and I'm going to focus on helping 
you, the listener, get more visible because at the end of the day, that's what equals sales. That's, that's very true. Um, and I don't think all of your listeners are females, but I'm going to say this anyway. Uh, part of that issue is because we live in a man's world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if you are a business owner and a female, my personal opinion being interjected here, um, yes, it is about vulnerability. Um, and we're naturally stronger women, stronger thinkers, we're doers. I'm not saying that you have to have those qualities to be an entrepreneur, but you better dig down and find them because you're going to need them. Uh, but it's a, it, it is a tough uh, game when you're a female business owner and yes, vulnerability. But I, I would like to encourage uh, these open conversations that we have so much, not in front of a microphone, um, it, it is find your person, uh, drop, drop into Taylor's DMS because there is encouragement on the other side and, and, you know, it's uh, not pay to play, you know, just reach out and, and have that courage to ask the question. Um, I know that, um, personally, uh, I had a hard time asking you for a long time and, um, and you offered the help and I was, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sometimes that's that fear of even having to admit we have a problem. Um, and, and on that, uh, we're going to segue into, I know you're shelving that, but what kind of advice do you, you, do you have for that? You know, I told you one of my favorite episodes was imposter syndrome and that kind of feeds all into that too. That was something very hard for me to overcome. Uh, especially in, in the wedding industry, there are people that are very sincere about helping you. Um, how do you, how do you talk to your listeners about that? Like what, what kind of advice to kind of get over that? I know you just said you don't have the answer, but, but I really think you do. Like, how do you get them up and over that fear to ask the questions or to have that vulnerability knowing that they could get squashed or they could get some bad you know, you're, that just comes with the business. So, you know, what, what's your advice on that? I think that's probably one of the scariest things for business owners, especially women, is to admit that there is a weakness. And I, I personally can't talk you through your weakness. You're going to have to do some soul searching on how you're going to rip your own weakness bandaid off. But if you can find that place for yourself and reach out to somebody that is already where you want to be. Because I, I think that that's important. I listened to a, a banker recently. She's been a longtime banker, a female. She's president of a local bank that is quite massive, like they're a regional bank. And what she has had to overcome in the banking world. And she said, you know, I learned real quick that I had to find alliances. Mm -hmm. Some were women, some were men. But I had to find alliances that I could say, you know what, you're where I want to be. So please allow me to ask you a question. And finding mentors in a space that is either directly in your niche or is walking side by side your niche don't be scared. Rip, like again, figure out how to rip your own weakness bandaid off, and then ask the question. I would love to ask you X, Y, and Z. Like, be very direct. Don't ask to take them to coffee. We're over the coffee things. Just be direct and say, "I this is where I'm at in business. This is where I'd like to be in business. How would you?" advise me to do X, Y, and Z, like get very specific, like two to three questions. Don't overwhelm somebody and then start a dialogue and then start building a relationship. Show up where they are, you know, showing off, you know, support them in a way where they can now see that you are genuine in your connection to them. And don't be afraid to ask if they would be willing to mentor you. If they don't have the brain space or the capacity, they may know somebody who can and align you with somebody that can help propel you forward. We cannot take on everything on our own. We can't be expected to have all of the answers. What you don't know, you don't know. But if you can seek out somebody that has already walked the walk, is already where you want to be, don't be scared to reach out and ask. 
when I first started the rental business, I reached out to a girl in North Carolina or Tennessee. She was not in my market, so I knew they would be willing to answer my questions. And I said, this is what I've done in the first two years of business. This is where I'm wanting to go. What would you advise to do differently or what would you have done differently? And they had no problem responding to me and giving me that guidance. A, I was not a a competitor threat. I was not in their market. And they were willing to take off that armor Mm -hmm. to be honest with me. And I feel like sometimes we we feel like people won't Mm -hmm. help. And there will be some no's. There will be some no's. And it's not you. Don't take it as an affront. It's not you. It's just where they are in their business, in their space, with whatever else is going on in the world that you can't see, but they will at least potentially point you to somebody that will. And you need to make sure that you you put that. Mm-hmm. If you don't have the capacity, do you know someone that will? Right. Don't be scared to ask that. But again, it comes down to you overcoming your own weakness band-aid and ripping that off in order for you to make that ask. And I think we would all move so much further in life mm-hmm. if we had the gumption to ask for mentorship. There's nothing wrong for asking for mentorship. I mean, there's teachers in the world for a reason. Right. Right. Very, very, very true. Okay, Angie, thank you so much for being a part of this very special episode for me. I hope the listeners get something from this. And it's just been a joy to have you in my orbit. And I was so I was glad that I know that you didn't say yes to this, like, like, oh, yes, I want to be on your podcast. But I'm grateful that you said yes, that you would sit down with me and have this conversation. It just truly means so much to me. Thank you so much for asking. And uh, it it kind of bounces off that last uh, ripping off the weakness band-aid. I've never done this. And so I really don't know that. You gave me a lot of room to say no. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, yeah. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. And then, then I anguished over it for a couple of days. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, my twang's going to come through. Anyway, I'm just so, I'm, I'm honored to be here. And uh, uh, I'm actually super honored because I've learned so much uh, through this personally. So this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I value our friendship. It's It's great fun. Maybe one day we should do that. Just bring like, folks in to sit in on our conversations. God, God love them. Yes. <laughs> we may have them sign an NDA first. <laughs> right. Woo! The things that will be brought up and it's all good. It's usually business too, but it, it can be obscure like Egyptian calendars. Yep. Uh, you know, that's a little bit of a strange inside joke, but Taylor's brain is out there in the best of ways. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And listeners, thank you so much for tuning into this episode and celebrating nine years. It's such a joy for me to show up behind the microphone every single week. And until next time, I hope you have a great rest of this one. Oh, wait, before I go, thank you truly for your support of my own business journey and this podcast, The Purposely Aligned Entrepreneur. If you know another entrepreneur who is in the same business trenches, who has already found success but might be feeling a bit lonely in their journey, my hope is that you'll share this podcast and this sisterhood with them. Because this, what we do day in and day out, isn't meant to be done alone. Speaking of lonely, if you're ready to squash the business journey loneliness, stop what you're doing right now and join the sisterhood. Visit bossgirlcreative.com forward slash sisterhood. I can't wait to see you in there.